Welcome everyone to um, what I think is our 11th session of uh, Living is Dying. And I'd like to begin with um, thanking you all for, you could say, um, putting interest into this matter. Of course, it's something that affects us all, but it's also something that in general in our culture is a little bit of a taboo. And for some reason, for good reason, in some sense, because it's simply just not something that our science really investigates. We have an extraordinary science in terms of the material, the objective, and so forth. But what really matters, and something like where we're heading in terms of our, um, in terms of our life, in terms of the nature of reality, um, in the sense that reality inevitably is understood through consciousness is a big lacuna it's a big it's a big void within the you could say body of knowledge that we have within the modern context so we have a lot of remarkable findings going to the to other planets we have a lot of remarkable findings in terms of submolecular particles and within medicine and so forth all of that very good but there's one big gaping, missing part in this science, and it's the understanding of consciousness. And consciousness is not something objective. It's not something that we can treat as a phenomenon, just like we look at um, outer phenomena. It's experience. And as long as we lack insight into experience, then we have a very limited, confined science. What we're fortunate is, as much as we've been searching for for life out there in the outer reaches of the universe, what very often sort of signifies a rather colonialist view in the Western world is the idea that there might actually be intelligent life in other parts of the world, other fields of science. And that's where I'd like to thank all of you because we here are actually listening to a scientific tradition that comes down from India and Tibet. And that's where the colonialist attitude is very often, well, they can't really know that much. But in actually applying introspection and applying, you could say, a methodology of knowing what is happening with the mind and being attentive to this, approaching it not in terms of belief, but in terms of observation, you could say empiricism, what is verifiable in terms of our experience with consciousness. We have a remarkable tradition and particularly then coming down from the Buddha, someone that actually penetrated to the core of understanding what consciousness is, what mind is, and what really constructs our reality. And that's where we're talking about two styles in which the mind goes into. Two phenomenologies, if you like, one of samsara, confusion, and also the condition that is, you could say, our potential, which is signified by nirvana, enlightenment. And that's where there's an incredible insight that we actually uh, have from this lineage, from this, um, from this tradition, which is not also a tradition of obedience to the authorities of those that came before, which would essentially just spell out dogma, but very much about verifying the findings of those that went before and having a fresh direct experience. So coming down to this day, we have then the insight into the nature of consciousness and consciousness not being entirely contingent on the body and us assigning primacy to consciousness rather than matter, we then have an insight into what happens with us in this life and also what happens with us when we pass on, when this physical condition exhausts. So we're going to look today at what Rinpoche has to say about what we call the bados, which is really a way in which we map and understand the various spaces that we go through. We can talk about the bados of this life. We can talk about the bados between death and rebirth. And this is very much the theme of then the uh, science of bado. And the implication of the bado really is that there's never a time where we can't actually break out of this particular, um, you could say, um, space. There's always the possibility of awakening. And that's, of course, implicit within all of the 
Buddhist teachings, but as Rinpoche was recently uh, teaching this, he made the point again and again how it's within the various spaces that we continually offer the opportunity to actually come back to being fully present and awake. Bado is essentially a state in which we're just tagging along with our habitual projections and our habit habitual um, obscurations. And the possibility, the implication of Bado is that there's always a time to gain liberation. So we're presently looking then at Rinpoche's text here. And um, let's see here. We're going to be looking at does karma affect the dying process? Okay, now the idea of karma is essentially that everything abides on the basis of causes, cause and effect. And this, of course, is you say karma is so basic that in some way, karma is almost, it's almost, um, it's a bit like talking about the air that we breathe or the water in which, which, fish swim everything is karma karma implies that when you put a seed in the ground something comes from it when we move our hand it has an impact in terms of the air when we think of particular things it affects how we feel so karma is essentially the law of cause and effect but what's basic to the buddhist teaching is the notion that there's particular there's particular conditions within our mind, particular styles of confusion that create the condition of suffering. And there's also in that this is something that's, you could say, curable. There are particular conditions that could free us from this confusion. So just like when a doctor sees a patient who has a curable illness, there's a diagnosis, where does the illness come from? And then there's that, that you could say, is identifying the causation of the illness. And then there's the causation of what will cure this illness. And that's what's implicit with the, the Buddhist teaching. And hence the, the notion of karma, which really just means action, is that we actually shape our reality. Now, this means then that you could say where we are now is on the basis of previous actions. And where we will go from here is then based on our present actions. The Tibetans have a saying saying, if you want to know what you did in your past, look at your present situation. If you want to know what your future situation will be like, look at your present actions. So anyway, this is thus something that's really basic to the way in which we understand how we engage with our reality. So Rinpoche says, Karma is so powerful that it influences every moment of life and death. If you have very good karma, no matter how often you move a house, you will always end up somewhere lovely. However often you advertise for new domestic help, you will always find someone kind and honest. And whenever you eat, and whatever you eat will always taste delicious. If you have very negative karma, no matter who you date, you will always end up fighting. And the food other people love will always make you sick. Similarly, how you die will depend on your karma. If your karma is good, you won't resist the process of dying or create any drama and will face dead, death calmly and sensibly. So karma, the way that we have shaped our mind, is not something that's given. It's not predetermined. It's not like we are in one particular way. But we have shaped ourselves in on the basis of our actions, on the basis of our choices in the past. And this then, you could say, consolidates or creates the way that we are now. So it's not, in no way a given. It's really on the basis of our actions. But there will be particular patterns that, that persist as long as we are in a particular, you could say, karmic flow. So Rinpoche says, so what is good karma and what is bad karma? It depends on your individual outlook. One person may think that dying surrounded by family and friends is good karma. Whereas for someone else, good karma would be dying alone in a thick forest with no tears or fuss. 
This actually made me think of a famous saying from the Kadampa tradition of Tibetan Buddhism, where it says, and this is really sort of the, 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 the practitioner, the hardcore practitioners determined to become enlightened. They say, entrust yourself to the teachings. Entrust this practice of the teachings to poverty. Entrust this life of poverty to death. Entrust this death to passing away alone in an empty cave. So the, there's various ways in which we would think what are the best circumstances for us to, to die. <clears throat> and then again, Rimuja says, others may think good karma is having someone at the bedside as they die to remind them about what they should do in the bardos or to recite the names of the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. Particularly, actually, we have in the, you could, in the tradition of meditators, the practice of someone who's either the teacher or a Dharma brother, Dharma sister, that actually sits and uh, reminds the practitioner of their practice. And that's where then a yogi will then have someone who um, was a Dharma brother or Dharma sister, sitting and reminding them about their, the nature of mind. There's some interesting stories that, that um, come to mind. There's the famous story of Tuguajan Rinpoche, who sat with his uncle, who was a great meditator. And his uncle had passed away. His you know, all vital signs had, had ended. And Tuguajan was sitting, giving him the introduction to the nature of mind. And the uncle who had already all vital signs had stopped. Nevertheless, he opens his eyes and at one point and says, okay, that's enough. I got it. <laughs> but in the, in, the, um, in the culture around death, then there is very much the notion that one could do so much for the person who has passed away. Rimuja then says, karma will influence you all the way through the process of dying right up to the final dissolution. Crucially, your last thought in the moment before you die will be the thread that takes you into the bardos, permeating your bardo experience with its own flavor and continuity. And that's why also very often there's this advice um, that, that would say at the time of dying, this is where it's important to have, you could say, cleaned up, to be completely at ease with who we are, with what we have done, and then to actually settle the mind on rejoicing in the good things that one has done throughout one's life and have that satisfaction that we did our best. We have no regret. So again, let me just, the word bardo is coming up here again and again. And what we mean with bardo is generally, yes, like Rinpoche was also saying the other day, we generally speak of the bardo as the time from someone dies until they take rebirth. But it really just means spaces. And so we can also see the present life that we have in terms of bardo. We typically talk of four or six bardos, where we would say three of the bardos is what happens when we are passing away. There's the moment of death, which for the yogi is seen as a great opportunity. The, what we call the, the, the bardo of actual reality or dhammata, where again, everything that exists really manifests everything that exists within our psychological reality and as such also is perceived as the external world arises. And that's where the yogi then who has familiarity with being comfortable with whatever arises sees this in terms of purity, is continually settling within the nature of mind. And again, there are many instructions that are given about how to recognize at that time. And then finally, we have the bardo of becoming, which is then the bardo of taking rebirth. And that's again where the instructions are again about be, be careful about where you take rebirth. Make sure you're taking rebirth in the right place. So these we, we refer to as these three first bardos. And then there's the bardo of this life, which is from the moment we're born until we pass away. And that also is a bardo in which if we have the possibility, there's the, pos the, the, uh, the, the potential for liberation. 
so sometimes also the bardo of this life we subdivide into the bardo of dream and the bardo of meditation. But bardo basically just means space. It means in between, intermediate space. So that's where we are. We always find ourselves being in a place going from here to what comes next. Right now we're in the bardo of the living is dying session 11. From it begins till it ends, that's a bardo. Everything is continually this sense of continuity in which we are moving from one place to the next. And within that continuity, there's always the possibility of freeing ourselves entirely from this conditioning. So, of course, we can't, this is it's not something that's done that simply, but at the same time, it is a, a possibility. And that is what we continually are operating with in the, in the, um, in the science around the bardos. So again, with regards to this moment of passing away, the last thought is so important. Crucially, your last thought in the moment of before you die will be the thread that takes you into the bardos, meaning the next, the following bardos of death, the bardo of actual reality, and the bardo of rebirth, permeating your bardo experience with its own flavor and continuity. Just as the quality of the seeds sown by a gardener affects the quality and quantity of his or her crops. Your good and bad past actions will also determine where you're reborn. If the gardener plants moldy or crushed seeds, nothing will grow and the outcome will be bad. If fresh, healthy seeds are sown, they will flourish and the outcome will be good. When we talk about karma, also, we very often um, think of it um, from two angles. One is that it's given that we have particular patterns. And most of us will know that we are prone to particular patterns, particular habits. Sometimes the habits can be difficult to break. And that's where we talk about karma sometimes. And also what's implicit here is that we have a particular direction. There's a particular style that we're pursuing. This affects us. And so we talk about shaping karma in a positive way. But we should also understand that the way that we, we are not, we are still talking about some degree of free will, if you like. And that's where on the basis of practicing the path, on the basis of not being stuck with our ordinary entanglement, in our habitual patterns, in our psychological material, there we begin to gain some sense of freedom. We're not just blindly um, obedient to whatever impulse comes into our mind, and we begin to have some freedom and some ability to actually make choices. This is on the basis of what we call prajna, and this is what we cultivate through the path, is this discerning in which we are not bound by our habitual impulses. And the degree to which then we cultivate this insight or this wisdom, we'll be able to make constructive choices. This is also something we can see in our everyday life. When we have, when we're a bit relaxed, when we're a bit spacious, then we also have the capacity to see clearly what's a good choice to make when we have various options. Sometimes when we're stressed, we just go for whatever is sort of the most convenient, or we might not even have the sense of having a choice. We just go with something. So the degree to which we have this spaciousness, this capacity and, and quality to discern, the more we'll be able to be free in making our choices. And that's also what's implicit in the, the notion of the bardos is that we have this, this possibility of freeing ourselves from the, the um, the way that we ordinarily react to our experience or our perceptions. So then Rimacher says, what does the moment of death feel like? Body and mind are intertwined inseparably throughout your life. At the moment of death, they split apart. And for the very first time, your mind experiences what it is like to be separate from your body. The body will then be burned, buried, or allowed to disintegrate naturally, whereas the mind will continue. And how you experience your mind once you're dead will be unlike anything you have known before. Now, 
many of us, most of us have grown up believing that it's the brain that creates the mind. But if you think about it, this is something that Buddhist logic would challenge because exactly knowing that particular seeds create particular results. An apple seed doesn't create a pumpkin. And so we can see everywhere in the natural universe how everything really um, comes about due to causes and conditions. To posit that something that is essentially just without consciousness could give rise to consciousness is actually e equivalent to an incredible leap of faith. And that's where the Buddhists, they are rather skeptical in regards to this idea that something that is unconscious, neurobiological systems and what have you, would be what gave rise to consciousness. Of course, there's a very sophisticated, um, there are sophisticated explanations around this, but at the same time, it's, it's really significant that the that neuroscience is essentially um, in no way in unanimous agreement about how, what consciousness is, how it comes about, and so forth. There's plenty of explanatory gaps and various camps. So this is where you could say the the modern community of scientists, they would say consciousness is the hard problem of science. It just hasn't figured it out. And again, like I'm always saying, the Buddhists might not have an, a very sophisticated material technology, but one thing they do understand, that is consciousness. So that's where we would we appreciate here when we should probably give the benefit of the doubt when we when we are reading here that when the body disintegrates, mind continues. We don't need to buy that as a dogma that is handed down from some very wise levitating Tibetan lamas who are full of love and compassion, and they're very nice, and hence we would like to just believe what they believe, but really approach this in terms of just hard reasoning and saying the very, there's, there's not much chance the materialist science would actually understand this, and there's every chance that the Buddha and those who have followed the Buddha actually understood consciousness on the basis of simply just their particular ways of approaching this and also the effect that this has had in terms of a a culture and a, um, a remarkable history of successful science around understanding the nature of mind. But apart from that then, continuing then the discussion here that Rinpoche is on to what happens with us when we die, and the mind then continues, then we can read here, and how you experience your mind once you are dead will be unlike anything you have known before. Imagine you are born wearing sunglasses. You wear them constantly until the age of 50, then suddenly you take them off. Instantly, the world around you changes completely. It may be scary, unsettling, or con confusing. But however it affects you, there is one thing you can be sure of. It will definitely be different. This is what the moment of death is like. And we are very often also would say at the time of death, the clarity of mind is enhanced. So all of a sudden, things become immensely vivid. Rinpoche continues, the specifics of what happens when you die will depend on how much experience you have of looking at your mind. As I have already mentioned, if you didn't work with your mind while you were alive, the moment of death is likely to be terrifying. Your fear will probably cause you to faint. Whether or not you lose consciousness as, at death will depend on on how good you are at being conscious while you are alive. In other words, on how mindful you are right now. So again, this is not about something that's particularly speculative or theoretical, but it is really about us presently relating to this awareness, this quality of mindfulness, which is about us essentially settling into this naked condition of knowing. We've discussed this earlier, and this is, of course, the stuff of Buddhist meditation. But it's very important that we're not talking about anything that is in the realm of speculation. It's in the realm of the verifiable. Rinpoche says, the separation of body and mind is a separate, terrible shock. It's like being hit on the head with a baseball bat, and most people faint. But just because you are unconscious does not mean that you are inanimate, like a block of wood. Your elements and sense consciousness dissolve and your eyes, ears, tongue, and so on, cease to function. So you will probably have no conscious memory of your previous life's thoughts or identity. 
And although you no longer experience gross consciousness, you will never lose the consciousness that is self-awareness. This self-awareness, the nature of mind, cannot be lost. In fact, already in our present life, we experience this when we, when we uh, are dreaming. Even though the, the, the gross physical body is just lying there, we have this mental body that continues to experience as we're, um, as we're dreaming. So the subtle consciousness doesn't, is not affected. Eventually, Rumja says, you will regain consciousness. Even though you're dead, you will be able to see, hear, feel, smell, and touch but not with your body's sense organs. In death, you perceive everything directly with your mind. You see with your mind's eye, hear with your mind's ear, feel with your mind's body, and so on. Precisely what you will perceive once you're dead is hard to predict. You may see your relatives and friends, but whether that makes you happy, sad, or afraid will depend on your situation. In the same way that mind plays tricks on you while you are alive, it will also play tricks on you when you are dead. So whatever you think, whatever you think you see will have been created by your trickster mind. Karma will have a big effect on your bardo experience because alive or dead, you are always subject to your accumulated karma. So essentially what we contain in terms of our material, our experience of subjectivity, our psychology, what is basic to our disposition. This continues. Devoted pet owners have asked me if this process is similar for animals. An animal's constitution, elements, senses, culture, education, and therefore projections are very different from those of human beings. Apart from anything else, unlike human beings, animals don't make plans, build companies, or oversee business empires. An animal's death and projections during and after death will therefore also be different. The projections tiny insects experience in life are not that different to their projections after death. Insects and animals are habitually in a state of panic and uncertainty while they are alive, far more so than human beings. So the uncertainties of the Bardo state will not be unfamiliar to them. Just a comment on this interesting picture up here with the rainbow. I identified these are actually the symbols of the zodiac. And the German down here, I just checked, it means the symbol of connection. So I guess there's the notion of that which takes us, you know, from one place to the next, intangibly, possibly. So then Rimiji says, what will you see after you die? Broadly speaking, Buddhists say that what you see after you die depends on your karma. It's far too simplistic to stereotype cause and effect by saying that bad actions will always bring about bad experiences, but that mistake is often made. Whether an action or situation is good or bad is extremely difficult to judge because the quality of the karma created depends entirely on the creator's motivation. The common consequence of any given action will therefore be different for each individual. And this is really where it's important also to understand when we talk about karma, we're not talking about one action leads to one effect. It's not like this one shot deal. You do this, then that happens. It's like, again, like the seed. You have an apple seed. Yes, it will give an apple tree. But again, depending on the, the quality of the seed, the, the soil, the... Um, the, the manure and the conditions, then the, the, the plant will grow in various ways. And also there's always ways to, to change, change a particular action's impact. So that's why, again, we talk about, when we talk about cause and effect, we always really would say cause, conditions, and effect. So it's not as if there just is this sort of simplistic idea, of this leads to that. Also, with regards to what determines the value of an action, like Rimbaud says, this is motivation. And so from the, the, the perspective of what's happening with us in terms of us as a being, in the, when we act, it, it's not so much the action itself, but what is behind it, what is our intention. 
So this is really um, such an important point. And so often our teachers, Buddhist teachers, they will say to their students, whatever you do, check your motivation. Why are you doing it? So Rimji says, but how can any of us be sure that we have the right motivation? Our true motivation is extremely difficult to pin down. However convinced we are of our, that our intentions are good, it's so easy to kid ourselves about what drives our actions. Too often, so-called right motivation is rooted in selfishness. And without being sure of our motivation, how can we be sure about the effects a karma will bring about? There's no fixed result for each individual karmic cause. For example, we usually imagine that having lots of money and being beautiful are good things. But one look at popular media shows us that the rich and beautiful are not necessarily happy. So the configurations of good and bad karma cannot be stereotyp can be stereotypified or stereotyped. And neither can the effects. So again, the what really determines the, the result of a particular action is the attitude behind it. Now, all of this comes about on the basis of a fundamental cognitive dysfunction, delusion. And this is what the Buddha's path is all about. It's the understanding of what has brought about confusion. What does the confusion consist of? What, how can we understand what we're experiencing within the confusion and how can we extract ourselves from this? This is just like if you study medicine, then you're understanding where the illness comes from, how the illness, you could say the, the picture of the illness unfolds, and also how can this be treated? What is the cure? But we're presently within diagnosing the illness, then this illness of ignorance that's driven by karma then manifests in various experiences. And we would say the condition of a sentient being is such that there's the notion of body. This, of course, in the Bado, we're talking about the mental body, but eventually then the body will find rebirth. They'll be looking for a solid place to sort of you could say, identify, to find a place of belonging. So the Bardo's, the Bardo individual is desperately looking for a place and eventually will take rebirth again in one way or another. And that's where such an individual will then experience essentially a condition of body and a, a condition of realm, a, the experience of a place around us, just like we have in a dream again. And within that, the various intangible conscious experiences. So what we would say a, a sentient being wandering in samsara operates with lifetime after lifetime are three conditions, namely body, consciousness, and realm. And this realm is then the experience of a particular place. Of course, this is all originates with the psychology, all originates with particular moods. So if we have, for example, like Rinpoche will start explaining here, if we have an aggressive mood, then this will color everything we experience in terms of the world around us. If we have a particular, um, you could say, self-absorbed um, sense of well-being and pride and contentment, then everything will be very beautiful. And so there's different styles in which the mind experiences itself and experiences the world around us. And that's what we refer to as the six realms. We roughly talk about six realms in terms of the six styles of the confused mind, which really operates within the psychologies of um, uh, ignorance, uh, strong attachment, uh, or rather ignorance, attachment, aversion, pride and jealousy and passion. And so this creates these six realms that we refer to as the realm of animals, the realms of hungry ghosts, the hell realms, the realms of the jealous gods and the god realms and the human realm. So there's all of these and we should, particularly for us who, who approach this very much without a culture of understanding really, you say the geography, <laughs> that goes beyond just our perceptions in this particular 
experience of the human realm, then what 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 very often Buddhist teachers would do is really describe these six realms in terms of what we can validate right now in terms of our experience, namely the, the moods, the particular psychological states that we find ourselves in. But it comes with the proviso that right now we're anchored in a pretty safe condition of the human realm. And when the mind is freed from this human, human body, it will eventually, it will inevitably, you could say, reconstruct itself, re-embody itself according to what it contains. And that's where there is um, a, a knowledge around the various states of mind that the, the that beings find, or rather the various conditions that beings find themselves. And that is what we refer to as the six realms, in which there are very painful experiences, and where there's various experiences in terms of what I was talking before, in terms of styles of psychology that bring about blissful experiences and painful experiences. So <clears throat> again here, in terms of we would want what we would want to to presently think about is really about constructing um, or creating, cultivating um, styles of mind that are, um, you could say, create a peaceful, peaceful death and a happy rebirth. So here Rinpoche then talks about these realms in which we take rebirth. When we can understand this, both in terms of you could say the long-term planning ahead, but also in terms of our immediate experience of this, of our present life. So Rimaja says, if you are, if you were an angry, aggressive person in life, and your actions were motivated by your anger, you will continue to be angry in your next life. An angry person is hard to please. So you probably won't like where you live. However clean and white your freshly laundered towels may seem, you will always find a stain. A rose garden will only ever be a patch of thorny bushes. However soft your sofa, you will never sit comfortably. However glorious the weather, you will always be too hot or too cold. In fact, wherever you are, you will never be at ease and there will always be something to complain about. There is always a strong possibility that you will be burnt or mugged on the street or stabbed, all of which is what Buddhists describe as the hell realm. So that's describing it very much in terms of the familiar parameters from this life. So that's the hell realm associated with aggression. Next has to do with greed or the sense of poverty, wanting desire, needy, neediness. Rimmage says, greedy misers, motive, motivated solely by stinginess and avarice, take their penny-pinching habits with them into their next life. As a miser, not only are you miserly with others, but also with yourself. You may own a great deal, three cars, two houses, cupboards full of kitchen appliances, jewelry, and so on, but you never use any of it on yourself or even consider sharing with those who have, there you have it. This, by the way, if you visit some churches in some countries, I remember going to an Orthodox church one time, and actually these graphic descriptions of the hells. And I, the Buddhists actually also pretty much would say, this is, you know, the experience of hell not created by somebody out there, but entirely created by our own mind. Anyway, so with regards to the miserliness, you never use whatever you have of, of any of it on yourself, but even consider sharing with those who have nothing. If you finally did splash out on an expensive jacket, you would probably die before you had the chance to remove the price tag. You're far too stingy to eat in good restaurants yourself, so it wouldn't even occur to you to buy dinner for someone else. However much you have, it is never enough. And when you die, you will be tortured by the knowledge that your good-for-nothing layabout relatives will, be thoughtlessly, will thoughtlessly fritter away your painstakingly accumulated fortune. This is how Buddhists describe those who dwell 
in the hungry ghost realm. So that's the condition of um, desire, wanting. Some people are fundamentally ignorant of what is going on around them. They may even deliberately decide not to notice the suffering of others. If you are this kind of person, you do your best to avoid feeling sympathy for anyone, actively encourage stupidity, ignorance, and lack of empathy in others, and take pride in being entirely unmoved by the suffering of a turtle or lobster as it is plunged into boiled water for your lunch. You educate yourself to form a thick skin so you feel nothing for anyone, and you socialize with people just like you. You celebrate your hard-heartedness and teach your children and friends to be as callous and cold as you are. Even if you own millions, you are unable to bring yourself to toss a penny to a ragged street urchin who has no hope of an education or of even seeing a toy, let alone playing with one. When this kind of person is reborn, it will be as it will be as a far more powerful being's juicy snack. You will no longer have a home or a postal address, let alone a bank account. If in your previous life you were a hunter, in your next life you will be the hunted. Whenever you are lucky enough to find a handful of food, you will be paranoid about protecting it and live in fear of it being snatched away from you. Buddhists describe this realm as the animal realm. So again, this is not about some creator that's looking down at us and saying, you did that, then now you're going to get this. But it's simply about the way that we construct ourselves. And if we construct ourselves in this sort of, in the aggressive way or in the wanting way or in just the sort of oblivious way, then this present life takes on a particular style, like Rinpoche is describing it here. Um, and we essentially are constructing our own patterning. So this is what then translates into then the future rebirth. So it has nothing to do with, with, um, with some sort of punishment. There's no such a thing as, you could say, retribution or so forth. It's really just continual about understanding how we construct ourselves. And this applies again to every single moment every micro moment of our present existence. And that's also why there's so much emphasis on what we can do with the mind in terms of just being attentive to cultivating good motivation, kind actions, calming the mind, creating the conditions just for being kinder, more compassionate, and essentially free from what really is the, the condition that pre precipitates all of this, which is self-fixation. Not self-fixation in a moralistic sense of being a selfish, bad person, but simply just in the sense of being confused, not knowing what's what, and falling back on this primitive condition of just saying self, I. And that's where being compassionate, being kind, being calm, actually is what takes us out of this particular patterning. So then continuing with jealousy. If you're jealous and act on your jealousy in this life, you will also be jealous in your next life. And here we, we're not just talking about jealousy in terms of being mad about others uh, having something, but it's more comparison, living with this neurosis of comparing ourselves. So it's not just that we're angry because, you know, somebody has, has it better or somebody made off, off with our lover or whatever. It's this living with comparison. Rinpoche then says, you will be reborn into a world where someone else always have what you long for, the look, the handbag, the shoes, the property, the partner. Even if you have it all, you will worry that others have more than you and that everything you have is of better quality. Jealousy and habitual overthinking will fuel your paranoia to such a degree that you will never be able to relax. Your jealous, envious mind will always find fault in those who are glorious, successful, famous, respected, and venerated. You will constantly practice animal realm. 
This is what we call the jealous, the jealous gods or the asuras, warring spirits. And actually, these are the warring spirits down here. They're looking up at the gods, and they're essentially, even though they themselves, you can say they're floating on clouds, right? This is the, actually this. This is what we're discussing right here. These, you can say, they are floating on clouds. They are gods, if you like. But they're looking at those guys, gods who have it better. There's the famous image of there's a tree that grows in the, in the jealous gods realm that grows up. And they nourish and look after this tree, but it grows up into the god realm. And then the gods, they sort of come flying by and they pick all the fruits from the... <laughs> That the, the jealous gods have sort of toiled to cultivate. And so then they're furious and they wage war against the gods. But the thing about the gods is they're so cool and unconcerned that they just easily just vanquish the, the feverish sort of <laughs> fury of the jealous gods. Anyway, so it says here, as such, you will constantly practice self-deception by convincing yourself that your jealous criticism is actually objective analysis, free from emotional entanglement. In reality, this kind of critical thinking makes it, makes it impossible for you to rejoice at another person's joy or to share in their happiness. Instead, your mind will be consumed by thoughts about how to cut the person you are jealous of down to size. Buddhists call this the Asura realm, or jealous gods. Warring spirits. And then, the, then there's then there's pride. If you are very proud, and your life has been motivated by pride, you will always be proud. You will also sorry. There's actually no such a thing as always, <laughs> but <laughs> as it goes in terms of us constructing the foundations for our next life, you will also be proud in your next life. Proud people are always convinced that they inhabit the moral high ground. They are born into a world where everyone suffers the same classic mix of inferiority and superiority complexes. It is a very parochial world. Everyone is small-minded, provincial, insular, narrow, small town, inward-looking, limited, restricted, conservative, conventional, short-sighted, petty, blinkered, myopic, introverted, illiberal, and intolerant. If you're born into this realm, no one will like you and you won't fit in. Yet you will be proud to be a member of a free society. Convinced that your view is the most objective and the most democratic, you won't hesitate to criticize others for having another point of view or an alternative set of values. Unable to tolerate any form of dissent, you will impose your values and ways of life on those who, in your judgment, are primitive or inadequate or evil, merely because you disagree with them. And by trying to force them to do, so, do as you do, you will make them suffer. This is what Buddhists call the God realm. The last of the six realms is the human realm. Although eventually we must liberate ourselves from this realm too, if you're not yet ready for enlightenment, it is the best realm to be reborn in temporarily. If this life was motivated by passion, you will also be passionate in your next life, always busy and always up to something. As a human being, you suffer from poverty mentality, constant uncertainty, and of course, birth, old age, sickness, and death. You are surrounded by people and things you desire, but you never get what you really want. And you always end up being separated from your loved ones because you spend all your time trying to make money you think will you will need in the you think you will need in the future, in a future that never comes. In spite of these disadvantages, the human realm is still the preferred realm for spiritual people. For all our sufferings, human beings enjoy rare moments of sanity, triggered by extreme sadness, depression, misfortune, and suffering. We also have the ability to free ourselves from self-inflicted bondage, which is far harder to achieve in the other realms. By the way, 
Although Buddhism describes six realms, samsara is actually made up of countless realms, most of which we cannot even begin to imagine. So what we looked at here, uh, what we refer to as then the six realms, and were really just the way that we each create our particular style. And we share then perceptions of our style with others. So we, we have shared perceptions. So this is where we, we talk about the realities of actual realms. But of course, it's countless. And like Rinpoche is saying here, it's beyond anything that we can imagine. So we're fortunate in that we have a, a, um, a tradition of science that understands what happens with beings in the various realms. So that's where, as much as you could say, there are aspects of the Buddhist teaching which are cultural. For example, the cosmology that we have in the Buddhist world uh, is very much shaped by the cosmology of old India. And that was really just you could, the Buddha really taught. Um, according to the conventions of particular times. So that's where the, the sort of, what do we call it, the heliocentric, the sort of the notion of the, our universe as orbiting around a sun and so forth. The Tibetan lamas and Buddhists everywhere they will be in complete agreement with that. That's not a problem. That's just conventions in terms of understanding uh, the way that the world appears to us presently. But as far as the six realms goes, that's not a cultural construct. And also the way that we, in the, for example, in the Tibetan Book of the Dead, we talk about peaceful and wrathful deities. These are not culturally constructed. Perhaps the ways that they manifest might be according to particular dispositions. But, but uh, and this of course also is tied up with our culture, but basically what we are talking about here are really the fundamental emotions that are tied up with ego, and that's universal. As soon as we have ego, then we have on the basis of ego, certain things that we like, certain things that we don't like. So we operate continually within this, this, this way forward, which we, we essentially, on, in the Buddhist teaching, we talk about five skandhas, in which on the basis of self, then there's what we like and dislike, and we then create narratives around what is good and bad. And on the basis of that, we then have particular impulses and experience of our individuality. But that's basic and that's universal. That's where there's no difference between our, our you could say, individuality and so forth across cultures. They're all tainted by these conditions that we call the, the various clashes of the various um, afflictions of the mind. And essentially, they all come back to this attachment and aversion and ignorance. And then also what we saw here, then we have pride, we have jealousy and passion. And these, these experiences, they are universal. Of course, here Rinpoche seems to be particularly speaking to a rather well-off demography, <laughs> seems to sort of be a theme in Rinpoche's book. Um, but it's really universal all across um, all across the what we can experience of our in within our human realm. If we go to other cultures, we can see the same styles of attachment and aversion play out. The same styles of ego play out all across the various cultures. So it's something universal that we're speaking about here. So hopefully, most of us can sort of nod and recognize this. Again, the reason we're doing this is that this is presently how the, the um, disease, the delusional condition of samsara plays out, but the implication is that we can do something about it. So that's the message that's being put forward here. So um, if there are any questions, I'll see if I can answer any. Question for Jakob. Would you agree that every bhadu is empty? All phenomena are empty. There's not a single phenomena that's not empty. The problem is we don't recognize them as empty. So that's where presently what we, uh, 
what we do in terms of the path is familiarizing ourselves with this dimension of openness. So again, that's what's implicit in Bardo is that we are, because our reality is not fixed, because our reality is empty, then there's continually this flow of one set of conditions to the next. And that's what we call karma. So the understanding of emptiness leads to the understanding of karma. And that's, but the problem is we get stuck in the appearances and that's where we want to extract ourselves. And that's where we look at the nature of this continual flow and that in things aren't fixed, they, and that they are empty, then we actually align ourselves. And that is what the path is about. We train ourselves in aligning ourselves with this understanding of emptiness. And that's all we're doing on the Buddhist path, creating this greater openness, creating it through training ourselves in compassion, training ourselves in calming the mind, training the mind in essentially constructive ways that create causes for happiness, and then also create a wider perspective in which we more and more understand the very nature, the very fabric of this experience we're having, which as we have seen is really dreamlike and insubstantial. So the more that we realize emptiness, the more we realize the, the nature of this perception really just being like a dream. And the more we actually have choice, the more we have freedom. And also the more we, the less we're caught up with this rigidity around the self, then also the more compassion naturally emerges organically from this insight into emptiness. Um, yeah, I don't know if Bardo is a good <laughs> a mantra. I don't know. There are various, there's a lot of mantras, you know, and the various mantras that we have, they're all based on the sort of the pure aspect of our being. So reverberating with that. Bardo is just a sort of a, a regular word. It's not particularly a mantra. When everything dissolves, can a dying person still remember and think of his, her guru, or need, need to be reminded by others around him? Generally need to be reminded. If it's somebody who, like we, we uh, heard about Tugurjan, uh, Tugurjan's uh, uncle, something gets away, he sort of wakes up and says, yeah, yeah, it's okay, I got it, you know. But otherwise, then there is the, the, uh, the need to be reminded. I remember once being with, um, with a friend of mine who was passing, Robert Filiu, and uh, Tukupema Wangal was there, and Tukupema Wangal was yelling really loud, not yelling, but speaking very loud and emphatically into Robert's ears. And there's very much this, um, this there's also, um, yeah, so yes. So it's of course all proportionate to, to the extent to which we've, you could say, trained ourselves. Can we meditate in bardo of dead and rebirth like our life, depending again, it's just like, if, it's a bit like if when we dream, if we can recognize our dream, then there's a chance that we have that kind of capacity. Um, but we would say it's so important that we presently um, habituate ourselves because we can see how distracted we are. So that's where we, we want to train now while we have the right conditions for, um, for mindfulness. What can we do if there were no practitioners around us and remind us Dharma while dying? Yeah, that's a good question. That's where we will be on our own. That's where we need to then have, have this autonomy and being, um, you could say, realized individuals. What if the guru keeps dissolving into our awareness as we die so we can't exactly keep aware of them as such? What if the guru keeps dissolving into our awareness as we die so we can't exactly keep aware of them as such. Well, the, the entire notion of, of our practice is mingling with the, with the unconfused awareness. And that is what the guru represents. So the moment that we think of the guru, we are essentially invoking and mingling with this un, unconfused awareness. So that's why it's very helpful to... Um, to continually what we call mingle our, our mind with the guru's wisdom. 
So that's that's what something that's something we'd want to do at all times right now, and it is what we want to then be able to do at the time of death. What is the most crucial thing a person must do throughout the dying process in order to connect with the guru? Well, to like Rinpoche was saying, to remain relaxed and accepting. And that's what he was describing as that's as a good karma, that we have this relaxed, accepting attitude. But that again comes from training. And of course, what, what we then do when we are relaxed is that we continually come back to our practice. We come back to this undiluted awareness. And this we can do in various ways through thinking of the teacher, coming back to our um, particular practice and so forth. Do we have a karmic obligation to anyone? For example, children, loved ones, as in the consideration of our dying process. Well, that's where we as sentient beings, or rather, sorry, we as on the Mahayana path, we say, yes, we have a big obligation to all sentient beings. They have all looked after us countless lifetimes. And so we vow to come back again and again and again. So, but of course, you may be more thinking in terms of uh, at that time, um, in terms of the practicalities, that's where I would actually refer to Neela. And who else was it the other day that came and talked about how to make simple things simple for those we leave behind by having made a good will and so forth. But in terms of our own journey forward, which is probably more what we want to focus on really when we're dying, then it's about relaxing into our practice and sustaining this clarity and awareness. So that's where it's important that we just leave things aside at that point, we don't want to be concerning ourselves with, you know, the, the children will have to look after themselves now. And what we are more looking at is on ahead. But if we're presently thinking in these terms, yes, that is where you then want to make a good will and make things clear for them. In terms of our greater journey onward as Mahayana practitioners, as Bodhisattvas, then of course, we're serving all sentient beings. We could have a trusted friend play a recording of our guru's voice while we're dying. Yeah, that sounds good. And someone was just asking earlier on if, if we could have that recording of Rinpoche, um, which I think actually is up. I, I would think it probably is up in the Dropbox folder now with Rinpoche's teaching on, on the instructions on people dying. Uh, just repeat on the request sent earlier. Can you please upload? Oh, there you go. Rimage's reading of Guru Rimage's advice to Yeshe Tsogyal, the refined essence of oral instructions from section five to the resource file. Okay, if it's not up there, we will make sure that it gets uploaded. Okay. What is, what is Lama's doing for 49 days when a person is in the bardo of dying? Well, let's just be clear. We generally say 49 days, but it's very individual. And according to the people's particular disposition and like we've just seen their particular karma it can be so many different ways it unfolds we sort of set 49 days as sort of a rough estimate um but what lamas are doing and what we can do are doing good things positive things there we have a connection with these particular people and when we have close connections with persons then we can do a lot for them when they have passed away. And that's where we would engage. And Rinpoche was also mentioning that particularly the first 21 days, we do a lot of um, positive uh, practices and dedicate to them. So this affects them. Just like if uh, we have relief, if, if we have a big debt and somebody else comes and, and pays the debt for us, it gives us some sort of um, relief. And then... Then uh, there's Tsering who's commenting, especially Guru reading the instructions at the time of death. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, of course. So if there's a possibility for that, yes. And we very often have, and this is of course what we can do as ordinary persons, but lamas, we have lamas who actually in many cases are able to benefit in an extraordinary degree. And that's where sort of from my pedestrian viewpoint, it's hard to fathom, but there are extraordinary capacities that great beings would have for benefiting others. Yeah.
Okay, sorry, we've gone a little bit over time. Uh, next time we'll have um, we'll have T Tara Francis who will be guest speaker, and she'll be taking us through chapter three: simple practices to prepare for death. So thank you very much for being present in this session, and I'm just going to conclude with with um, dedication. Just a sec. This virtuous accumulation of merit we offer so that all obstacles dissolve, and that at the time of our death, each of us may find ease in dying and swift rebirth in the pure land of great bliss, quickly gaining enlightenment for the benefit of all sentient beings. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jakob, and good night. Thank you, Jakob. Thank you, Jakob. Thank you, Thank you, Jakob. Thank you, Thank you, Jakob. 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 Thank you, Jakob.